more Booster 11 parts arrive at Massey's, the new OLM begins construction at Sanchez, Ship 34 returns to Mega Bay 2 at the build site, and Flame Trench digging begins at the launch site. Welcome and thanks for stopping by for this week's Starbase Flyover Update Episode 60, brought to you by RGV Aerial Photography. I'm Jeff A, and I'll be your guide today as we check out the progress at SpaceX's facilities located at Starbase, Texas. Before we get started, let's have a quick look at this amazing labelled panorama image. These images were taken on October 7th with clear weather, so sit back and enjoy the views from 10,500 feet. As always, here's a labelled map of the site for reference. Special thanks to Procky for creating these. Beginning at the southeast side of the site, we can see the aft dome of Booster 11 after it was recovered from the Gulf by HOS Ridgewind and transported here. Anthony from Rocket Ranch took time out to capture this awesome footage of the booster parts arriving along Highway 4. Be sure to give the Rocket Ranch a follow on X. All these pieces will possibly be analysed to help improve the design going forward. A mix of Raptor Center and Outer Raptor engines have been set aside, likely going to McGregor for inspection like previous engines that have left. HOS Ridgewind has since departed for Louisiana, meaning that no further pieces will be recovered. Taking a look at the fourth level of the structural test stand, we can see it has received its walkways and railings. At the stand, we can see the cap has been removed, with the five large rams stored closer to the LOX tanks where the blue pipes for the test stand are stacked. Next to the nose cone jail, the flap simulator, used during testing, can be seen. On October 8th, Test Tank 16 will be lifted out of the stand following its test program. Finally, let's go over the events of the site for the week. After arriving at Massey's, Booster 14 conducted three cryo tests on the 4th, 5th and 6th of October. It was then moved back to the build site on October 7th. Here's the map to get you orientated. Let's start at the most important area of Sanchez right now, the Pad B OLM assembly area. As you can see, assembly has started for this new square design with all the parts we mentioned in the previous episode lifted in place and being integrated. More sections were delivered over the week including this rounded one that has the bays with the hold down arms but interestingly lacks cutouts for the 20 Raptor QDs, confirming that those are being removed from the design. Since this flyover, two corner sections have also arrived. Other parts that appeared have a label that says Top Deck Pancake Exterior Launch Mount, most likely for the top part of the OLM. This design suggests that the deck will be water cooled, just like the flame deflector at Pad A. Four more stands seen here will be used to support the corner pieces, with one of them currently holding a total station. Here we have renders from Chrome Kiwi that shows how we expect the structure to look when finished based on the parts already seen. Now, at the stand construction area, the newest booster transport stand has had a coat of black paint around its exterior. The latest turntable is progressing with its assembly and some elevated stations have been completed. Nearby, the parts for a new Starlink Pez dispenser jig lay in wait for assembly. Further along Highway 4, we have yet another mystery assembly. These four rusty steel frames are triangular shaped. Could these be part of a deflector in the new flame trench? At the speculated subcoolers for the methane recovery system for Pad B, the work wrapped up here as all the scaffolding has been removed. We expect this system to be similar to Pad A's, where all the methane is recovered and recondensed before storage in the tanks. Moving to the ship QD arm assembly area, most of the parts are already mated together and welded. At this rate, the entire structure will be built in about two or three weeks. We'll keep an eye on here. Below them, the chopsticks reinforcement work has started. As you can see, metal plates are being welded in place on the rusty parts that don't have paint. The remaining work should conclude here, where the stops were removed. At the carriage, scaffolding has been set up for further work on it. They are adding strengthening plates to the upper arms. Along the edge of the site, new protective covers for the transformers at the launch site are being assembled, and three were rolled out the following day. Rolling to the scrapyard, a nose cone, some ring transport stands, the two-point lifters, some B4 Raptor engines, vaporizers, tanks, and B4's engine section are entirely gone. This has made room for a future project, possibly for the Ship 32 scrapping process. Tell us what you think down in the comments. Over in the rocket garden, legs for a new type of stand have been placed on the embeds on a ship parking station. It's unclear what these are for yet, so we have to keep an eye on these too. Finally, at the parking garage, its entire side has been fitted with this moisture-resistant sheathing. Specifically, it's Georgia Pacific dense glass sheathing. Jenna Hammer posted this ground shot on X of the garage, including this amazing Mars colony graphic being placed on top. 
Let's see how it'll look once it's finished. Now let's take a look at the build site. Let's first look at the labelled map. Starting off at the bays, there wasn't much to see this week from the air. As a recap, at the high bay, Ship 31 continues to see more work on its heat shield. In Mega Bay 1, Booster 14 has returned following its crowd testing at Massey's. That makes it Booster 13, 14 and 15 in the bay. Interestingly, we can now confirm that Booster 14 is now back in the centre stand with Booster 13 in the back right. In some previous episodes, we had reported Booster 12 to 14 in order along the back, but when Booster 14 was lifted from its stand for testing, it was discovered to have been on the back centre stand, which was not where it was believed to be. This also makes more sense, as we saw Gridfins installed in Booster 13 in the back right station, but it was thought to have been Booster 14 at the time. In Mega Bay 2, Ship 33 should still be on the back left stand. The newest development in vehicle construction can be seen here in this clip from La Padre's Rover 1 cam. The nose cone and payload bay for Ship 34 was transported from the Star Factory to Mega Bay 2 in the early morning hours of October 8th. It will first be lifted over its Starlink Pez dispenser, seen entering the bay on October 4th, before the next barrel section continues the stacking process. As we return to the air, between the two megabays, further organisation of items has taken place. The ship's static fire stand has made its way back to Massey's, as it will be some time before Ship 33 is ready for static fire testing. This area now stores the two-point lift stands. Only one two-point lift remains, however, as the second one was dismantled and left Starbase, as the limited number of Block 1 ships that can use them remain. Around the back of Megabay 2, limited progress is seen on the drainage work for the small factory extension. Behind the factory, things have been quiet this week. In the flap storage area, one of the Block 2 forward flaps made an appearance. The eastern ring yard has a few single rings, but also has little to see. Construction at the office and connected to the factory has shown another week of progress. Along the north end of the office, the two pipes that run underground to the chiller units have now been connected to the building's cooling system. Steel structure for the office factory connection continues slowly. This space has been a much more complex design to the main factory building. This portion of the building appears to have a taller area that follows the exterior wall above the lower wing and connects to the mid-level of the factory roof. As seen in this top-down view. Keeping with this view, we can see that it appears all the remaining footings are complete for the taller open space of the factory floor. Returning to the office, the tallest part is nearly finished with its final roofing layer. Over on the shorter segment, the pallets of insulation have been staged for this area to be finished soon. The front of the office hasn't seen much progress, so we'll have to keep an eye out for when more glass panels and wall cladding arrive. Finally, we will take a brief tour of the village, as a few projects continue here. Drainage work continues along the south half of San Martin Boulevard. We can also see that the entire road surface is being removed in preparation to build up with the full median we see to the north. At the intersection of San Martin and St Jude, we see some new block structures being built. It appears there may be some type of gated entrance for privacy in portions of the village housing. At the sushi restaurant, two concrete pads seen last week prepared with forms and rebar have been poured. The building appears to be in preparation for concrete floors, with blue vapour barrier laid out. Finally, we'll check out in on progress with the pool construction. The two smaller ones to the west, thought to be a hot tub and shallow kids pool, have been concreted. The larger pool is looking much like the others did last week, with formwork and plumbing being installed. With that, let's travel east to the launch site. Let's first look at this week's labelled map. This week, the flame trench excavation at Pad B is in full swing. The northwest end of the trench has been dug down, exposing some of the piles. The full pattern of the piles is still unclear, as much of this excavation is filled with water. Along the commodities path, the sheet piles have been cut off to access the outer area from within the main trench. Turning around the corner, we can see the covers have been placed on the precast trench for the tower commodities. Dirt has also been added along it to bring ground level to this trench. Looking above, the remaining six commodity pipes from the tower have been extended following the path between the base and back structure. To the side of the tower, the CC8800-1 crane has been lowered and partially disassembled. The main boom is resting on stacks of crane matting, suggesting it's not been fully disassembled. To lower the derrick for the upcoming launch, the main boom would need to be removed. The stacks of crane containers have been partly unstacked as well, possibly to prevent the plume from Booster 12 knocking them over. 
This week, continued work on electrical conduits progressed to the four new vaults. Two of these appear to be for electrical supplies and the other two are turning toward the existing communications bunker, suggesting control electronic systems. To the east of the fluids bunker, the BG28 drill rig, previously drilling piles in the original tank farm, is now working in the area likely to contain the water farm for pad B. Construction over the tank farm continues. The piles have been finished with the two foundation rows being formed and filled with rebar. The north row has six steel embeds placed to support future tanks. It seems that three tanks are likely to go here, so we'll have to keep an eye out for some additional tanks, possibly as soon as October 11th, when two new tanks are set to arrive at the port of Brownsville. Taking a wider view of the tank farm, tankers can be seen offloading at the road. This flyover occurred later in the day following a partial tanking test on October 7th. We can still see the vent near the lock sepo exhaust draining off excess LN2. Many of the uninsulated pipe connections and the lower portions of the subcoolers are still frosted from the testing. Pad A is still clear at this point, with the chopsticks in their open position. Near the retention pond, Movac trucks are pumping excess water to clear the pond for testing later that night. In this clip from La Padre, a little after midnight starbase time, the deluge system would be tested for the first time since the static fire of Booster 12. This test included the launch activation as well as the smaller activation approximately 6 minutes later that will happen when the booster returns to be caught by the chopsticks. Following the tanking test of the Flight 5 full stack, SpaceX posted to X that Starship's fifth flight test is preparing to launch as soon as October 13th. This post included an update to their website detailing the plans and timeline for the test flight. At this time, speculation is growing that October 13th date may be a serious consideration, with some industry insiders hearing that regulatory approval may come much sooner than the late November estimate most recently stated by the FAA. No TAMs have been published for the hazard area at the launch site as well as the ship landing site in the Indian Ocean. Flight closures for October 13th, 14th and 15th have also been issued. October 8th would see Ship 30 once again be de-stacked from Booster 12 for what should be final preparations. In this photo shared by Starship Gazer on X, FTS charges were installed in Booster 12 and Ship 30 on October 9th. In this photo we also see the remove before flight payload bay door locks have been removed in preparation for launch. And that's it for episode 60 of Starbase Flyover Update. We hope you enjoyed your flight with RGV Aerial Photography and hope we see you again. If you liked what you saw today, please subscribe for more episodes and content so you don't miss out on the new videos each week. I'm Jeff A, and we'll see you next time from 10,500 feet.